All right, I'm Dave Rett, and uh, let's do another round of sound tips. This is the second one I'm doing, and I got a bunch more coming. I don't know how many tips I got, but there's got to be hundreds of them, I guess. Uh, I've been collecting these over the years, kind of writing down ideas that I think will be useful or stuff I want to remember. Uh, so let's start it off with... Um, this is a pretty, an older one. Never tape the grill of an SM57 back onto the mic. Um, and this is uh, meaning don't like run a ring of tape. And if you're familiar with 57s, SM57s by Shure, um, the grills come off pretty easy. They hit them with a stick, they pop off, this little copper ring comes out, springs off into the middle of nowhere. And uh, every once in a while, you'll see somebody has um, lost the ring, lost the clip, and taped the mic grill back on. Um, with directional mics, the way that they, directional dynamic mics, um, typically the way that they are directional, or they uh, gain their directional capabilities, is by letting sound into the back behind the diaphragm. Um, so when you're fairly close to the mic, the sound hits the front of the diaphragm, most of the sound hits the front and very little of it uh, or a small percentage or it travels a longer distance to get to the back of the diaphragm. Um, for sounds that are farther away, for behind it, the sound would hit the front of the diaphragm and the back of the diaphragm at the same time, kind of canceling, um, canceling out and giving it rejection behind. Um, these porting systems that allow sound to get into the back of the microphone are fairly sensitive. Uh, some of them have various fibrous fills and ways of reducing, altering the frequency response of stuff getting in the back. And they're usually pretty well thought out. So any variation to that can really screw up the um, polar patterns and directionality of the microphones. Uh, I've seen some cool ways people have fixed SM57s using... Um, little wire tops from a champagne uh, bottle and uh, putting those down and kind of pinning the grill on that way or taking small bits of tape. What I would do if I lost the clip is I'd take some uh, gaff tape and run like three small uh, eighth inch wide strips of gaff tape uh, around the outside vertically and then run a ring above and below the vented port area that um, the 57s have, yeah. There's actually a vented area around there that you don't want to cover. All right, next one. Um, in the time that a sound, the time that it takes sound to pass through, a typical A to D or D and D to A converter involved in just about any piece of audio gear that goes through the digital domain, um, sound could travel say 150 miles down the copper wire or about a foot and a half through or 18 inches in um, air. Uh, so these three different velocities, uh, it's actually not three different velocities, but these three different time frames. Uh, if a digital console has a latency of 1.5 milliseconds, um, it takes 1.5 milliseconds about for sound to travel that 150 miles down copper wire and about a foot and a half so every time you run a piece of digital equipment that adds latency you're physically or your time you know you're moving something about 18 inches back and you can for all practical purposes ignore um, copper wire as a time delay it is so fast uh, all that analog gear all that tube gear all those comps and stuff from the days of the past, sound travels through that like lightning, literally like lightning, so fast that it's irrelevant. As soon as you convert it to digital uh, and you go through those A to D converters and you start putting in, um, you know, 0.8 milliseconds or whatever, um, those, those cumulative time delays can be um, an issue. And I'll talk about those more in some future sound tips. Um, condenser mics, tend to have lower, la lower mass diaphragms and dynamic mics, which make them more sensitive to detail, wind, and feedback. Faster. Um, 
Yeah, the ultralight diaphragms, uh, those super thin mylar metallic films uh, have so low mass uh, for condenser mics that, um, you know, with even the slightest breeze or P-pop or, or um, uh, air motion will cause that diaphragm to move a significant distance and create a tremendous amount of, low, of sound and low end. Um, the same thing goes with... Uh, Oh, because they're so light, their frequency response tends to be wider. And uh, you'll see condenser mics often have a much wider frequency response, uh, accentuated high end. Um, feeding back faster. The mass of the diaphragm, when it's cycling back, when it's feeding back, it's out of the wedge, into the mic, out of the wedge, into the mic, and it's coming back. The amount of time it takes to ramp up, it's subtle, but it is noticeable that... Um, the feedback from a condenser mic tends to be very sharp and quick compared, or sharper and quicker than a dynamic mic, and you can kind of tune your ears to that. That can come in helpful if you're not sure which mic is feeding back, if you hear certain types of feedback, um, maybe zero in on the condenser mic. And then also handling noise is another artifact of this as well. Since the diaphragm of a condenser mic is lighter um, and there's less mass, if you shake the mic back and forth, um, on a dynamic mic with a heavier diaphragm, that, di that diaphragm is going to want to keep moving. Uh, object in motion stays in motion. When you stop, it's going to want to, um, again, keep moving um, when you reverse direction. The condenser mic with a much lower mass diaphragm, as long as the wind isn't getting to it and it's got good isolation from that, it's not going to have as much handling noise from the, um, the diaphragm mass, or shouldn't. Um, that said, they tend to be extremely sensitive, so your handling noise might come up in a different way. Uh, what else do we got? Condenser mics. Oh, confidence. Selling confidence. Build success by selling confidence. Confidence that when the artist walk on stage, walks on stage, all will be flawless, or at least as close as it can be. And this has to do with... Um, us as engineers, um, you know, people have asked me how I was able to work my way up in the in the business and uh, mix so many high profile artists, and um, I put some thought into it. And what I came up with is um, selling confidence. When when they walk on stage, if they know if I'm out there and the band and artist 100% believe that the sound will be as good as it possibly can, be in that environment, in that venue, with those tools at hand, and nobody's going to do a better job, or a few people are going to do a better job of, um, of um, mixing the sound or making them sound good, you know, they, they're going to play their best. And um, the same goes with the monitor system. You know, if they're confident that when they walk on stage that the monitors are going to work. If something goes wrong, you're going to fix it uh, quickly and everything will be addressed. Uh, selling confidence is not blaming other people. It's not, um, uh, if something goes wrong, even if it's not your fault, it's identifying what the problem is and dealing with it in the perspective of like, okay, yes, I screwed up. This is what went wrong, and it will never happen again. Um, and these, I have things I'm going to do in order to assure that. Um, that kind of mentality. All right, what else do we got here? If you give me the tools I need, I will give you the outcomes you desire. Um, that's a... Uh, kind of the theory or the basis by which um, I ended up with, that's how I, people, I say, people ask me how I was able to tour with such massive double hung sound systems and huge L acoustics rigs and, and um, on such a grand scale, always having uh, premier stuff, premier gear. And, um, it comes from that concept. Give me the tools I need to do my job and I'll give you the outcomes you desire and then fulfill that. Um, and the corollary to that, if you don't give me the tools I need to do my job, I will do the best I can 
with the tools you give me. Um, but I won't guarantee the outcome you desire. And you can leverage that too against the um, production managers. You know, it's like, okay, well, if you don't, this, if you give me this, everything's going to be great and you'll get great reviews um, and the band will be happy and it'll sound awesome. If you don't do that, then, you know, just let the band know or let the management know or, you know, you're taking responsibility for dropping this down. Due to cost savings, we're not going to give, uh, we're not going to deploy the equipment that um, is needed. And um, I'm okay with them taking that responsibility and I'm okay with um, an artist or a production manager uh, saving money in order to um, hit a budget or whatever. Um, as long as they're willing to take responsibility for a portion of the outcome as well. Let's see, what else do we got? Oh, one more. Um, the sounds on stage have a polarity. So the bass rig, for example, the speakers in the bass rig have a polarity. They're, they're putting out sound. We mic that sound. And we put a DI on that, and we check the mic, and we check the DI and make sure that they're in polarity with each other. But you have to go further than that. With, as soon as you start sending that bass to a wedge or a side fill, now you have that same sound coming out of multiple place, points in space. And when you have the same sound coming out of multiple points in space, um, you want to pay attention to polarity, time, phase, and... Polarity, time phase and distance. So we'll take a look at that, the polarity of the bass coming out of the wedge. Um, first what we'll do is we'll stand equidistant between the bass rig and the wedge so that we're at a summation point. Send the bass to that wedge at about the same volume as the bass rig and have somebody or play the bass and listen to it. Uh, if you have someone at the board, you can hit the polarity switch and uh, you should hear in uh, when it's in polarity, it should be louder when you're equidistant between the, the monitor, whatever it is, and the bass rig. And if it's out of polarity, you should hear a, a cancellation in the low frequencies. Um, the side fill, the same thing would apply. You'd send halfway between the side fill and the bass rig. Um, typically, or actually your monitor rig, what goes in should come out. So if you put a mic on something and it picks up a polarity, it should come out of the speaker in the exact same polarity that the mic picked it up. Um, so if the cone of the bass rig moves towards the mic, then the mic diaphragm would move in and then it would come out the spe monitor speaker, which would cause the monitor speaker to move out as well. So the bass speaker and the monitor speaker are both moving outward at the same time. Uh, we can go back to the other tip about uh, the speed of sound and the sound coming out of the bass rig it travels acoustically let's say eight feet and comes out of the wedge travels eight feet your wedge is 16 feet from the bass rig let's say and you're standing in the middle um, if you have a digital console it's going to take an extra millisecond and your digital gear might um, delay the wedge sound um, down delay it by a millisecond or two um, so we'll take that into account and we would move a foot closer to the wedges or two feet closer to the wedges to find that acoustic center point where we're acoustically, electroacoustically um, equidistant from the bass rig and the wedge. All right, that's it for today and I will see you next week with more sound tips on uh, number three. Cool, cool.